I don't often work on mannequins other than to use them to occasionally get blocks from. So the block for this particular dress did in fact originate from working on a mannequin. It's my mannequin that I've had for many, many years and it's got a bit of history to it. It's done all my shows in Fashion Week and I once lent it to Hussein Shalane to use for his collections and it's got a nice little message from him written on it and so it's got a bit of sort of value to me but it's not actually a shape I like that much but it's for this dress I did use it. I was able to make these patterns from it and these patterns although they look I mean they've been trodden on lots of times because they get chucked on the floor but they look fairly neat with some seam allowances on it and they're also symmetrical but the actual process started from something that resembles more like a cave painting something like this. I would take a rectangular piece of cloth and I would get a bit of string if it wasn't already marked and I would put it through the exact centre front and the exact centre back and then I would push the fabric, pin it through the centre front, push it onto the shoulders so it's nice and smooth, push it underneath the arms so it's nice and smooth, put pins in it, pinch out a dart, in this instance it's a upwards diagonal dart which we call a French dart, that just gives it kind of contouring for the bust and once I pin this all in place I then get a marker pen and I just mark my neck, my armhole. I feel through the um, shoulder seams, I feel through the centre front, I feel through the, where the side seams are and I mark these all. And then once I've done that, I get another bit of another rectangle and I stick one on the back, pins through the centre back, push it up, push it to the sides, pin it and then continue my lines around. I design my necklines and design my armholes to look good. Once that's all done, I take it off the stand and unpin it and I lay it flat on a piece of paper that's folded double so that I, I can unfold it so it will mirror through the centre front and centre back lines. And from something very, very rough like this that doesn't look very accurate, you can then very easily, just using a uh, tracing wheel, make a pattern that then unfolds to have all those details on and then I add a side seam seam allowance and a shoulder seam allowance. I don't put a seam allowance on the neck or the arms at this stage it's just a prototype I'm making and I would put that on later if I was, I'd have to first consider how I'm finishing it, whether I'm lining it or binding it or facing it or whatever, but for the prototype I don't need it. And usually when I go around colleges I give copies of all these patterns to students to use so they can try it out themselves. But if you ever you want to try it out, just get a rectangle, put it on, draw your lines, unpin, unpin it, trace it off, it's not difficult, it's not like, it's not rocket science, it's, um, it's not, it doesn't have to be mathematical, it doesn't have to be neat, you know, it can be from something very rough, you can do a, a, a slightly rougher, uh, less rough version and a slightly less rough version and eventually you end up with something that looks like, wow, that's so neat, aren't you good at pattern cutting? But that's how it sometimes works, you know, so you don't necessarily do the good pattern cutting straight away. You're allowed to be a bit sort of like freehand with it. Another way of doing it is sometimes take garments you already have and lay them down and just plot through them and make a neater block from that. That's quite good because you already know those garments, you might have a feel for them already. And also they, they are, will be in certain materials which you will kind of relate to. So then all materials are different, they all have certain drapes and uh, you'll then know that if you're going to remake them that you've got to find a material that's similar. Too often people um, pattern cutting calico. Calico is often used everywhere to make prototypes but calico is not really like anything. It's, it's a kind of an unforgiving fabric that shrinks and creases and doesn't drape very well and I prefer using bed sheets. Bed sheets come in a wide range of colours um, and they're cheap as chips and they're nice and soft and to me that's a kind of a better thing to make a dress from for example if I'm going to be making a, a garment that has material that's a bit softer. Always choose your prototype fabrics that are similar to the, gar um, to the materials you're going to be making in, in the end. Um, also, calico is quite expensive compared to a lot of cheaper materials and I don't quite understand why people use it. They do it, I think, because they've seen it on TV or they, in films or on, in books or perhaps some pattern cutting tutor says that it's the thing you have to use. But I, it's, it's, question these things, question everything, you know, because um, it's important um, because it, it changes the way the garment, make, the way you feel about the garment, the way it, you handle it, the way it drapes, its softness. We're making things for people and so it has to have a certain softness to its geometry. Okay, so I start off with a block like that and that's the top part of this, which you can kind of recognise, but then everything else is chaotic and everything else is just fluid. And I'm going to put it on a person, I think, because um, I kind of think it will 
be better to see it on somebody with arms and legs and head that can move around a little weeny bit. This garment was actually originally made for a girl called Anastasia last week in, Mox in Moscow. Because um, I usually choose a person and use some of their measurements. But um, today it's going to be worn by Abby. Is that right? Is it Abby? Yeah. Sorry. I'm so bad at remembering names. That's a quite miracle I ever remembered it. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I'm not going to, all you're going to do is I'm going to put it over what you're wearing. I've got it facing towards me at the moment and I'm going to put my hand down the neck to the hem and then back up the other way. There's a reason for this is that if you just maybe hold one end of it like that, um, maybe you hold actually that end of it. If you open it out, I want everyone to be able to look down inside it. So I'm going to move, if you open it out so the audience could look down as if it was a tube. Okay, so this is what I call tunnel technique, okay, and it's, it's got actually a series of holes inside it. Some of them you can see and other of them are actually slightly harder to see. But it's like a catacomb. A catacomb is kind of like a, a cave where you can go in one direction or another direction. And there's different ways of getting into this garment. You don't have to go through every single hole. So the way I usually just figure out the best way of putting it on is I go down through the neck and then back up again, because that way I know that I'm pushing all excess fabric onto the back. I know that only through experience, you know, trying it out and knowing such things. I'm now going to put it over your head. If you put your hands in the air, like you don't care, and uh, put, that's it, just aim at that. It's going to stick to your clothes a little weeny bit, because cloth sticks to cloth, but not too much. Okay. Now this garment was cut in an hour, okay, in front of an audience. I didn't know exactly what it was going to look like. It's actually quite a good length on you. Um, if you just step a little bit, uh, just about here. And if you just give me just a slow turn just for a minute. It gives me time to sort of think about this thing. Okay. What you have here, right, if you turn sideways and point face in that direction. There's a kind of, um, what might look like a pocket on this side. That if you follow through it. Where does it go? It goes over there. This is a kind of a strange twist in the fabric of space and time, a little bit like a sort of a black hole, um, which is not in fact a hole at all. When you, when you join two, if you have a continuous strip and you cut a hole in it and you cut a hole in it, if you were to join those two holes together, you actually create a third hole in between those two holes. It's actually a loop, and that's the loop between a hole. If you actually want to figure out where the hole is in this, if we look at the front, if you come this way, if we look here, there's a seam here that's on the front, but if you follow it, it eventually ends up on the back. So that means that if the, whole, if the seam is both on the front and the back, that means that the person must be stepping through it. So you're stepping through a hole, you just don't know it yet. I'll show you how that works in paper form in a little bit later. But I'm going to take this apart so we can see what it looks like. Um, there's actually two um, loops holes that you could put your hand through. There's one there. There's probably another one somewhere else. It has two points on it as well. There's a point here. And where's the other point? There. So it's got two little pointy corners, which suggests that if it has two pointy corners, that maybe it's something that was maybe rectangular or triangular or something like that. Even though it's something that looks soft doesn't look like it's angular at all. I'm just going to mark, make some marks. So this is A to A. And then I'm going to find the next hole, because there's only actually two pairs of holes that make this dress. I know this just because I cut it. There's another hole here, which is B over to B. Now this hole is different to that hole, only in that it starts on the back and it continues and it stays on the back. So th this, your body is not actually passing through this hole, this pair of holes, in fact. You're passing through one at the top, but you're not passing through that one. In subtraction cutting in tunnel technique, you can pass through some of the holes or all of them. It will change the way the garment uh, looks, but you don't have to go through every single hole. I'm going to cut it apart to see. I'll start with the side seam. On this side, the side seam starts underneath the arm and it ends at this point down here. So it doesn't go down to the bottom of the hem. It's starting here and then it's just ending. If 
I cut it apart, we'll have a look at it. It's a loop. Just turn around this way. So we've got one looping side seam on that side. The other one, come around this way. Sorry, you're <laughs> going to get dizzy by the end of this. This one goes on much, much longer. So it's asymmetrical. It hasn't got the same type of side seams to each other. But they are both loops, as you will see when I cut it apart. where it ends. So it loops in a very, very large loop from here all the way around to there. So two looping side seams, one of them a short loop, one of them a very long loop. Next up, I will take apart the lower hole. So if you go this way. Like draping, if you make something on the stands a nice shape, you always have to mark it so that when you take it off you can understand how to put it back together again. So in this example I've only made two marks and that's back and front. But if you were going to be draping you'd probably want to make more marks to understand how this thing constructs or deconstructs if you just go that way. We have here a hole and that hole is actually roughly about 100 centimetres in circumference and it was measured so that it was the biggest measurement around the body that I knew a person could step through if they wanted to, comfortably. And it joins to another hole over here. That's the one I just cut it apart from. And these two holes come together, and I've just cut them apart. And that was hole B and B. Hole A on the front here. Is the one that your body is stepping through. So this hole was joined to that hole. I don't know if it's possible you step out of it. Perfect. Now we have a very interesting looking garment that's on your body. The next thing we'll do is we will cut it off your shoulders, I think. Julian, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, anyone wants to ask questions, do. Okay. Is the question, what are you doing? <laughs> I would do. I'll show you some sort of mood boards in a little slideshow at the end. But it's sort of like um, I collect tons of stuff, yeah. and if I was doing it for a particular person, I want to know all the ins and outs of how they think and what they're feeling and what their themes and colours are and moods and inspirations. And um, I would always gather those things because they're the things that rub off on me and make me think of different things while I'm cutting and making. I don't really see any lines between designing and cutting and sewing. To me, it's all one thing. And um, so if I'm collecting things for fabrics, colours, prints, all of those things also inspire how I might cut. And certain lines and, um, that I might see in, say, a building or a chair or a piece of graffiti I might spot out and about, then maybe those lines will come out into my pattern cutting in some way. There's a way in which I put all my work, I like to put all my work up on the wall rather than having it in sketchbooks. And, but I still like to have it on one sheet of paper so that it's portable. So I'm, I put a big sheet of paper on the wall and then I stick all my inspiration up and I can see it in one go. Because I find that a lot better than seeing it in a sketchbook where you have to turn the page each time because you often forget what was there previously. And uh, I think it's best to be able to stand back and reflect upon it. And so in my studio, if I have one, then I will be having... Uh, lots of stuff up on the wall that while I'm pattern cutting is kind of there and kind of it's like this thing called the Sword of Damocles where the sword hangs over you on a single hair of um, horse hair. It's kind of like pressing down on my mood and it's kind of in, it's sort of um, inspiring me and so is the music that's on. I, I'm always listening to music and if I'm listening to hip-hop or pop or classical or whatever it might be those kind of musics really affect the way I think and the way I feel. I've made, this is a kind of a tube, right, because it's been sewn along this long edge here, down this edge, and then back again, 
all the way along. And so it's like a long sort of duvet. You can get into it down that end, that's where your legs come out, but you can't get out of it down this end until we, I cut the holes, which allowed you to uh, exit out of it. So actually this garment started off as like a pillowcase duvet shape that I cut a series of holes into. I actually cut, in this example, five holes, but I call it a six hole dress because it has a hem. It starts with a hole. The hole is where your hands are now and that's the hole that you got into it from. I'm just going to cut it apart one stage further. I'll just flip it up the other way so we can just see the other side. Oh no, I didn't need to do that. So on the yellow side, there's three holes. And on this side, there is one very big strange hole, which I'm going to explain to you. And then a smaller hole, that one there. Let's look at it totally flat though, because this will be the first time this garment has become a flat pattern. You I don't know, if you stay there for one minute, you're not going to be wearing anything anymore because it's now unwearable, but you will be my little magician's assistant um, helping me lay it out. And I'll cut you in half in a moment as well. Uh. So this is a long selvage I'm, s I'm ripping open. And then this is the top edge, which I'm just going to rip one part open. Now suddenly it's flat. If I kick that towards you, you've got the hem end. It's made from two materials equal to each other. They're both about three metres long, although I didn't measure three metres. I kind of just do one, two, three, because I don't like to measure using numbers too often. Um, I, I prefer to measure by eye or to measure by hand or by feet, like walking. Sometimes I like to measure by strides, which I'll talk about in a moment. I find this not an inaccurate way of measuring, but actually more accurate more accurate than numbers, because people use numbers but they often get confused by them or they forget why they're using numbers in the first place and what that number relates to. We are, after all, making garments for people and people are not made up of numbers, they're made up of a series of curves, no straight lines at all. Quite nice to see this pattern. You can now have your seat again. Thank you so much, Abby. <laughs> a round of applause. Just going to take a quick picture of this, just to because I'm, I'm going to leave this for you. This is yours now. You're going to have to um, find something to do with it because it will lighten my luggage if I don't take it back again. <laughs> yeah, I think I have signed it actually somewhere. Down that end. I'm just going to do a picture of everyone. <laughs> right, so what we have here is five holes. We've got one hole that's a very odd shape. Then we've got A and A, these two match together. And then we have B and B, and they match together. So two come together and two come together, and that helps form the shape of the garment. Whereas this hole is the top of the garment because the legs are coming out down there. It's kind of strange and confusing. I'm going to explain some of it to you on paper because it will help you understand it a little bit more. Can you see this board all right? I'll do some as big a drawings as I can. I can't remember I put the pen. I need blue. In fashion, there's lots of conventions that we often don't consider and don't think about. And one of them is that the primary angle for looking at a garment is this angle of a house. I always usually start with a house, but I'm going backwards in this process, so I'm showing it sort of nearer the end. This house steps on the ground, sits on the ground, and I call it a frontal view of a house. Change my own pens. A frontal view, or you might call it an elevated view. Frontal means that you see the front of it only. You don't see the back, you don't see the sides, you don't see other angles. And we often deal with fashion in this way. We put so much emphasis on the front, far more so than the back. And when people are designing garments, they always make them stand upright on the ground, facing forward. Why? It's a convention. We are not just one-sided. We are multiple-sided. We are total all the way around. We breathe and move in a dynamic. We sit down. We do other things. And yet we treat garments when we make them as if they're completely lifeless and upright. And that's how we often design them. 
And I know if I say to a group of students, I want you to do 100 designs for collection by tomorrow, I know somebody will always come forward and say, do we have to do back views? Because it's like, well, yeah, if you need to make a garment that is complete, you know? Otherwise, make an incomplete garment or just a two-dimensional garment. It stands on the ground in this frontal elevated way. Um, elevated means that it's standing upright. It's got a bottom and it's got a top. And when we draw people, we often make them stand upright. Even pyjamas and nighties, which are made for lying down, are often designed standing up, but we cut them as if they're standing up. So we have a hem facing towards us at the bottom and a neck at the top, and we make it stand upright because that's kind of where our thinking goes. If we are draping on a stand, the, stand, the mannequin is upright, symmetrical. And we'll approach it and we'll drape around it, but we'll always keep coming back to the front to check if it's right, because the front is so important to us, always. This sort of convention goes through the way fashion is both designed, cut and presented. We have a catwalk where it's a long strip and slightly raised. We put our audiences front row, second row, on each side, divided a bit like a wedding between not bride and groom, but between buyers and press. Celebrities stuck in the front. Actually, the most important people are inhumanely piled up on top of each other here at the end of the catwalk, and that is the press and the video artists who get the, uh, the shows out into the world. And I'm sometimes sort of with them, videoing a fashion show, and I notice that as the model comes down the catwalk, all the cameras are going, like a big wall of cameras, going chick -chick 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 -chick, like crazy. And then when the model turns, it all goes quiet. Because the money shot is front views. And although you might have a few lone photographers in the audience, taking side views or detailed views. If you look at Vogue Online, Style.com, Collectioni, The Book, L Online, you'll just get front views, front views, front views, front views endlessly, as if nothing else exists. When of course they do. There's a more total way of looking at garments and I'm gonna try and get you to that stage by mixing up some geometry. This view of looking at a house is like seeing a top or a dress, man or women, from that angle, or a skirt like that or a trouser leg, a single trouser leg like that, which might have a pocket, or a sleeve from this viewpoint. But a sleeve is a kind of a little bit more interesting because a sleeve is a back and a front in one. It's kind of like a tube that therefore, by being cut as a tube within its geometry, when it's closed, has a hollow space inside it. All garments are made from hollow tubes. Otherwise you can't get into them. Put backs and fronts together. They just make a tube. So this technique I'm teaching you now is called tunnel technique, mainly because all garments are tunnels, all garments are tubes. Um, a shoe is a tube, but it's been closed off at one end, and so is a hat. It's been closed off at one end often. Um, I often teach people who, make, who are architects who um, make buildings and tents and things like that, and they can use this same technique I'm going to be showing you here called the tunnel technique, because essentially it's just made from tubes. To explain how it works, there's another way of looking at garments, okay, from a different perspective. This perspective here I call a worm's eye view of the world. It's a worm's eye view because you're kind of on the floor looking up at it. And the way I learned pattern cutting, when I was at, at 16, when I was, uh, first went to my college to learn BTEC, was from this book here, and it's called Winifred Aldridge's Metric Pattern Cutting. It's a fantastic method of pattern cutting, really amazing methodology, but it is quite mathematically complex. It has a series of sort of measurements and sizing scales and for 10, 12, 14 that you have to learn. It's a great way of learning, but it can be quite confusing to some people. And the very first lesson we learned after doing a skirt block was a close fitting bodice block. And you have a diagram on one side, which you follow from one to two to three to four. Then you have a series of instructions on this side. And these instructions are, have to be followed by the letter, step by step by step. And they're quite confusing. because You kind of think, well, this doesn't seem that creative. And I thought, you know, when I first started fashion, I thought fashion's a very creative thing. And how come everything is suddenly very scientific and mathematical? The very first instruction on this is half the bus measurement plus five centimetres, i.e. for 88 centimetre bus, that's 88 share between two, plus five equals 49, square up and down, mark this line, this is the centre front. So we've got the centre front through one instruction that's super complex. So I found this quite difficult to learn. Another reason why I found it difficult to learn wasn't just that I found was a little bit averse to using numbers all the time, uh, was the fact that um, I'm dyslexic with lefts and rights and opposites, up and down, black and white, those kind of things which is why I failed my driving test lots of times, because they say go left and I go right. And it's not that I don't know where 
left or right is. It's just I, it's the terminology I get confused very easily. Uh, you know, it's, it's quite common. It's not uh, unusual. But when the pattern cutter was in front of our class, it was an amazing German cutter called Lena. She was pattern cutting uh, from the book, but the book facing towards herself. But also she was pattern cutting because we pattern cut in the same way. We I like reading a book as if it was a, back, a book with a left and right centre front. We also make it stand upright with a hem at the bottom and a neck at the top. She's pattern cutting towards herself this way, but I'm sat in the class where you are learning it upside down. Now in my dyslexic mind, this got confused and I started storing the information the wrong way up and it got very sort of like muddled and for some while I was in the wilderness of um, uh, being mixed up with pattern cutting, not quite understanding it uh, for some time and then by just continuing and going, you know, working with the problem rather than going against it, I kind of just devised my own way of doing it, which is muddled up and a bit strange. And I'm kind of quite open to that kind of way of working. So I cut sort of from an upside down perspective quite often. Um, people that work on Gerber and Lectra um, computer systems for pattern cutting, because they work on a screen that is landscape, they'll often work sideways. Like I showed you the trousers on the screen sideways. But um, I've noticed in schools where there's lots of people working on Gerber and in companies too, because uh, I often go teaching at companies like COS and H&M, that when they're in these teams working, that they're kind of, although the pattern's on the screen this way, they're kind of doing this with their necks and they're getting later in life injuries in their necks where they're trying to make it stand up because they feel they have to make it stand up because that's the conventional way of looking at garments. But there is another way of looking at it that is a bit more unusual. And this perspective isn't used a great deal in fashion. Um, it kind of comes and goes. It's like seeing a house from this perspective. I call this a bird's eye view. A bird's eye view or an aerial view or a Google Earth view or whatever you want to call it. It's like looking down. And this viewpoint is used in sometimes making kimonos and sometimes in making ponchos in South America. It's historically interesting because it's often used. But in Western cutting, it's really only used um, most often to make a garment that goes in and out of fashion, and that is a circular skirt. And a circular skirt starts with a negative space, a hollow space that is the dimensions of your hips or your waist. And then once you've got that, you then put another circle around it and make a donut. And immediately you've got a garment that on its side pulls upwards to become a tube. I love the simplicity of this kind of garment that starts with nothing and uses gravity to form itself. If you get any piece of fabric and you cut a hole in it, if the hole's big enough for your waist or your head, then you've made a garment. And I love that kind of simplicity. So what I try to do is mix these two perspectives together, a worm's eye view, and sorry, a bird's eye view and a worm's eye view into one pattern. And to try, that's what this is here. This is actually multiple viewpoints because you're getting into it this way. This is coming out that way and then your body's tunneling through the holes. And to show you how I got to that, just so you understand the thinking, I'm, I merged these two together. And it always has a starting point. If I was going to make a house or a tent, I'd use the top of the roof. If, it was a, if you want to use this technique to make a top or a dress or a menswear top, then just take the top part of a pattern. You don't need the bottom bit of it, just the very top. If you want to make a skirt with it, then use the top bits of the hips. If you want to make a trouser, just use the top of the trouser block. If you want to make a sleeve, just use the crown of the sleeve, the very top part of that sleeve. And then you can use the same technique to make all those garment types, which is pretty much all garments. If you want to use it to make a jacket or a coat, then start from here, make the garment, then cut it up the front to separate so that you can open it. And that's the beginning point. And then once I've got my beginning point, and this pattern is either made by tracing on a mannequin or tracing a garment that I like to feel and look of, or drawing around a person, or using a historic pattern or old pattern. If you've already got patterns already, you can just use the top parts of your pattern as a starting point. Once you've got that starting point, and I'll show it in a dress form here, the next stage is that we extend it really long. How long? First question mark of many. People always want numbers, it's particularly if you learn sort of this kind of pattern cutting, it's obsessive with numbers. You know, you need to know all the sizing scales and things like that. But actually I try to avoid numbers as much as possible. I, look, I work in proportions instead. So if I'm looking at the proportion of this, I would say that this bit here is more than the length of a body. So it might be one metre more, two metres more, three metres more. It's up to you, your choice. I'm not going to tell you. You can decide for yourselves. Just go more than the length of the body. I think it's good to go at least twice if not three, maybe four. The longest I've ever done was 
72 feet. And 72 feet is about from that wall to that wall and then back again. So garment 72 feet long. And the reason I chose this number was that I was working in a studio space, a bit like the one where I was doing the reverse cutting in, uh, that little film at the beginning. And the um, studio, if you measured it, was 36 feet long. So from that wall to that wall there. And I was in this space and I was making lots and lots of garments for London Fashion Week and I was hanging them up, as I often do, because I like to hang garments so that the seams open outwards and gravity takes them down. Um, and the moisture in the air is absorbed into them, and then I get to see the look of them slowly. Uh, I'll often work on them each at a time in rotation, which you'll see some pictures of later. But as I was making more and more of them, because I was quite prolific, the studio's getting filled up, and it's actually getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And uh, I'm feeling more and more claustrophobic in this space. So I measured the studio, and then I times it by two. And then I started making garments that were twice the size of the space I was in. That allowed me to escape that space in my mind, um, psychedelically, and uh, to be able to kind of feel that I could walk around the space as if I could measure the pattern instead of, if you're making a pattern that is twice the length of this room, you don't want to be using centimetres or millimetres or something like that. You'll be there all bloody day. But also halfway along you'll forget what you were doing or you'll make a mistake because you'll, you'll slip and you'll, it's much better to simply get some cloth and just simply decide by eye where you want things to be or to measure by strides or jumps or feet the much better unit of measurement to use so that meant that I was able to pace around inside my pattern as if it were an architectural space and understand it in a different way because I'm not making the garments for me I'm making women's wear so it's for a different kind of body but I can still get inside the pattern in a different way when we are starting at college we often are given these kinds of tools, which this one is my college ruler and it's called a Pattern Master, which is a very grand title for a piece of plastic. Um, it's got lots of measurements in millimetres and centimetres and different lines on it that I've never used. And um, it's also got this curve on it that might be perhaps for drawing an armhole or something like that or a neckline or something. But why on earth, if you were going to be drawing a curve, you'd want to follow something when you've got your own rotational device of your wrist and your hand or your elbow that make much better lines. These are sort of abstract lines. But uh, what I like it for is it's a good handle to hold on to. Um, but sometimes these measurement tools, they don't necessarily make you more accurate or make your work easier. They can sometimes make it harder or less responsive to the shape you're making, which is a human shape. So I prefer to work with real people and measure them because people change all the time. They're living, breathing, every inward, outward breath they, ch they change, but also every month your body changes. You know, it's kind of like you're never static. So I really prefer to work with real people because those measurements are far more valid and to maybe not have numbers involved because then when you're free from numbers, you've got one less kind of complex thing to think about. You can get on with by being creative in other ways. If I was to measure a person, if it was a man or a woman, there's usually three dimensions I would take. It would either be the bust or the chest for a man, your waist and your hips. And usually for women, the hips are the largest measurement, unless they've got a very large bust. And for a man, it's either the hips or the chest. But if I was to measure, say, this mannequin stand here, just for the sake of argument, even though it's not a human being, when I take measurements, I don't take close to the body measurements. I allow a certain amount of space between the garment and the body. So just to use some numbers, the largest measurement of this mannequin will be the hip measurement, and it's 96 centimetres. If I increase that to 100, I know I'd get in and out of this fairly easily, but also get up over the bust. And because of the way that on a human being, your shoulders can manipulate, you'd be able to get it on, on over your shoulders as well. So 100 centimetres is big enough for this mannequin to get through. If I was doing it on a person, I'd, go there, I'd take their largest measurement and just make them do this a bit. Just feel, does that feel good as a garment getting through? That gives you some sense of the type of garment you might be wearing. So I then usually don't take a number measurement. I'll show you that one in a minute, perhaps, because um, numbers get in the way. And it also makes people feel a bit awkward about themselves. Because when, when you're taking a measurement for your bust, 
you don't necessarily mind people knowing. When you're doing your waist, people are like, oh, I don't want people to know. Hips are like, oh, hide it. You know, as if for some unknown reason, people get scared and worried about these measurements. So I often measure instead from the big end of the tape measure, from the 150 side. So then when I'm measuring people, they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller, rather than larger and larger and larger. Because I don't actually want to know the number. I just want to know the distance. So I just hold it in place. And then that's the measurement. And I will show you a way of how to make a circumference measurement using this kind of technique where you don't use numbers anymore. That, and it gets away from using this thing called pi, which is a mathematical thing that I kind of have no time for. But I can um, f be equally accurate without the numbers and without pi creating a circumference um, in a bit more of a tactile way. If I was measuring a person, say it's this mannequin, it's 100 centimetres. If I take a piece of fabric and I cut a hole 100 centimetres, I'll be able to get that mannequin all the way through it easily. So if you take that concept to a tube of cloth, here is a front and a back. And it's just been folded over, and you sew your shoulders, and you sew your side seam, and you turn it inside out. And it's suddenly a long tube, far too long for a person, but it's kind of the same looking back and front. I'm just going to put on, I like to have videos playing when I'm making things, so then you've got more things to look at. Because um, it's kind of interesting that you don't just sort of follow what I'm doing here technically, but also just some of this rubs off on you in some way. Because all of you are from different backgrounds and doing different kinds of things, and it will just stick in your mind at later times and maybe come back to haunt you when you least expect it. I think it's always good to overwhelm people with information and with, um, uh, with uh, visuals. And I often, like my interpreters who are either language interpreters or a much harder job being perhaps a, interpreter, a sign language interpreter, they've got to try and keep up with me and I don't even know what I'm saying myself. I haven't got a script, I'm just kind of jumping around all over the place. So it's <laughs> I, I do uh, take my hat off to you if I was wearing one, so uh, well done for bearing with me. You're going to feel um, like you've done a proper exercise by the end of the day, I think. Um, this is folded into a tube. You close your shoulders. These are slightly harder to put into the language, but it's now, we're now looking at visual objects. So. It's a tube, and what's going to happen next is I'm going to fold it, a bit like folding a fan. I'm going to fold it to the front, then I'm going to turn it over, and I'm going to fold it to the back. And I'm going to turn it over again and fold it to the front. And that's how you'd make a fan if you were doing it in a piece of fabric. It's sort of like a zigzag concertina shape like that. Now between what you're doing in this, by this, if you ever look at origami, is that some fold lines face towards each other, a bit like a book closing. And we call that creased line there a valley fold. And if you look at it on the other side, on the top where it's folded, this uh, seam here is what you, not seam, this uh, fold here is what you call a, a mountain fold because it's at the very top of a mountain. I'm interested in the valley folds, the ones that where things come together like a book closing. And if I use this little scored um, mi um, valley fold line as a mirror line, and I cut above it a 100 centimetre hole, call it A, 100 centimetres, and it joins across this fold to a pair on the other side, then A matches across to its, on the other side A. And if you then go to the next valley fold, you cut a hole at 100 centimetres, B, cross this line to its pair on the other side, B. And then C to C. Depending on how many times you folded it, like this is a short piece of paper, but if I had a dress that was 72 feet long, then I'd be folding it many times. I'm also not saying fold it by a certain quantity. It's up to you to quantify it. If you do a small fold, you'll get a ripple of volume. If you do a big fold, you'll get a huge wave of volume. This is how you learn to control it. But at first, you have to just try it out and see what it does. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sew these holes to each other, and I'll show you a bigger model so you can understand how that might work. So we have front and back, fold it together, sew your shoulders, sew your side seam, turn it inside out so your seams go onto the inside. I then fold it, one on the front, turn it over, one on the back, turn it over, one on the front again, so three in this example. Three folds, and between each fold line there's a valley fold line, and I cut a hole, let's say it's 100 centimetres just for the sake of argument for that mannequin, and they match together. There's always pairs, so this hole then on the other side matches there, and then this matches there. And it's like making a kind of a concertina zigzag, but as it gets into floppier, bigger shapes, 
Geometry doesn't hold in the way that it does with small paper objects. When you get into fabric, it's completely different. The geometry goes out the window quite a lot because it's bending, moving. It has grain lines, it has bias grains. It, different materials have different properties and they stretch and uh, flow in different ways and drape. I'm going to sew each of these holes together. And the way that I do that, in fabric, you can pull this inside out, but in paper or cardboard, you can't because it would rip or tear. So the way it works is that hole A goes over the top of hole A, and I sew around it all the way around with a one centimetre seam allowance. So two holes become one hole. And that, ho that happens to each of these holes. So you A sews to A, B sews to B, and C sews to C. And what happens is that all the holes are now pushed onto the inside of the garment. They're not on the outside anymore. They become internal holes. In fact, what you get, this is a 100 centimetre hole. If you were to cut that mannequin in half, it would fit within that space because it was an easy measurement. This is a rectangle, a continuous piece with two holes cut in it, and then those two holes are sewn together with the one centimetre seam allowance. And what happens is that the body is going to pass through these holes, and instead of seeing holes, on the outside you're going to see seams. If you remember, the dress had a seam that started on the front and ended on the back, and that's because the body was passing through it. If you had x-ray vision or you were using transparent materials, this often works very well in transparent materials, you'd be able to see the body going through the holes. But if you use opaque fabric, you would never know there's holes there at all. And in fact, when people cut the holes, they often think, where the hell are the holes gone? Because the holes end up being in a place that you're actually standing in. And that kind of confuses a lot of people. I do love that confusion, though, because you know, the, what gets bigger, the more you take away a hole. You know, it's, it's increasing as you subtract it. It's a sort of a weird thing that immediately confuses you. But confusion's a good thing sometimes. This garment has a hem at the bottom that you come in through, through the first set, through the second set, and through the third set of holes. And if it was sewn together, you wouldn't see my arm anymore because they would be joined. But in fabric, it's just going to collapse in a very sort of intriguing and unusual way that you can't entirely predict. You need to actually make it to find out. As a garment, it's got one pleat on the front and two on the back. The side seam doesn't go straight the way down. And like you notice in this, the side seam doesn't go all the way in an easy straight line. It actually, this one zigzags backwards and forwards. If you were to see it as a garment pattern, you can see it from a worm's eye view, like a person standing upright, like we always see garments, with a top and a bottom. Or you can float above it like a bird, and you can see that you come in through the hem, through here, through here, through here, through here, through here, through here, and out. So you're weaving through this pattern. But it's not a very exciting dress, it's not very novel, so I think I'm going to take it one step further. And this time, I'm going to use two materials, one stripy, one plain. Uh, two materials of your choice. One, it could be that one's stripy, one's plain. Maybe one's transparent, one's opaque. One's heavy, one's light. One's jersey, one's woven. You decide. All materials are different and they will fight each other. So a battle will commence as soon as you make the garment and you've got to learn to see what those materials do because they all are different. When you've closed your shoulders and your side seam and turned inside out, you end up with a tube that's stripy and plain, far too long for a person to wear. This time, instead of folding in straight lines, we fold at angles. It's not an angle of 22 degrees or 75 or 48, it's an angle of your choice. So let's forget numbers and just be tactile with it and decide where you think is right. And it's folded back front, back front in the same way as before. And instead of having straight valley folds, it's now got an angular valley fold instead. And so if I cut a hole that's 100 centimetres here, it's going to mirror across that line in a slightly angled way and then you go to the next fold. B, across the B. And then the next fold. And onwards until you run out of folds. Always pairs of holes, otherwise you end up with a, your body hanging out of the hole and your bum on show or something like that. So it's important that there's always pairs of holes because then they get put inside the dress and they vanish. Here's a big one. Stripy material and plain material. Folded, close your shoulders, close your side seam, turn it inside out. Folded at an angle, one on the front, one on the back, one on the front. Now something weird happens when you work at angles because when those holes are sewn together in the same way, when you get into it through the first set, through the second set, through the third set and out the top,
which it creates a very unusual and strange shape that is stripy up top. The back is ending up on the front because this is the front. So it's stripy and plain. And on the front, it's plain and stripy. So the back has ended up on the front and the front has ended up on the back. And in fact, if you follow a side seam, this is the left side seam. It zigzags across the body and ends up on the right. And the right side seam zigzags and ends up on the left. That's really amazing because backs and fronts, lefts and rights are now kind of confused and that's great for a dyslexic pattern cutter where you don't need now to worry about those things anymore, about where they stay in place. In terms of um, fabric and material, because of the way that fabric is woven, we have, we have uh, little tiny sort of uh, threads which are called warps and then going across wefts and between them at 45 degrees we have the bias grain line. Now on some materials, this, the bias grain line is very strong and it stretches a great deal. In a garment like this, all the grain lines are colliding and you never know what on earth it's going to make, depending on the material you choose. And everyone who ch might choose different fabric will end up with a diff a diff quite a different looking garment, depending on its material. So you, you've got to make it. You can't just simply design it on paper or cut it in paper. You've got to make the thing, because otherwise you can't possibly understand the shape it's going to make when this collapses. In terms of a garment though, worm's eye view, viewpoint, standing up like a person, bird's eye view, above it, all seeing through here, through here, through here, through here, through here, through here, through here and out. The only difference between the two is that's folded straight so the, so the holes are straight. This has a rhythm to it. I'm going to take it one step more complicated just so you can understand that now that we are uh, doing asymmetrical things, we don't have to think about lines of symmetry, we don't have to think about rulers and we can do more freehand work. If we were drawing a dress, rather than just do straight lines, why not do freehand drawn lines? Left and right not the same as each other. As long as it's a tube, then instead in this instance, you're going to get lines that instead of straight, when it's all folded up as a garment, it's going to be beautifully freehand and it will make more decorative work. So why not be unmeasured and freehand with it? I'm using circles as holes, but there are, the reason I use circles is when a circle joins to a circle, if you sew around it, it's strong all the way around. It doesn't have to be a circle, it could be a square or a triangle, or it could be a letter J, or it could be a love heart, or it could be an amoeba shape, or it could just be a cut line, as long as when you slice that line, the distance around it is big enough to get through. That's a non-subtraction, because you're not actually taking anything away. You're not losing anything. You could do a 100 centimetre hole, joining onto a 300 centimetre hole, in which case we have to gather or pleat this smaller before they join, and then there's going to be an explosion of volume between here. You could do a hole that's the shape of a skirt that joins to another hole, the shape of a skirt. So the body's passing through these holes, but these subtractions that you remove are used to make a skirt. So now we're making a dress and a skirt. This is a zero waste pattern because it does, it's using the waist in intelligent ways. I could be making women's wear and then out of the subtractions I'm making men's wear. So men's wear, women's wear can be all confused. It can be all in, you know, incorporated together. But you never know what this might do unless you try it. You can't just sit there and, and think, yeah, I'm a designer, I'm doing a design now for a pretty picture of a garment. You actually have to get your hands dirty. You have to touch cloth. And that is proof of love. You are touching the material, you are making it, and you're discovering the design through that process of making. And that's why the design comes last. It's the last in the process, because you don't know what it will be until you've made it. So you can kind of relax. You can just see what happens. Maybe you'll make a mistake. Maybe that mistake would be a good thing, not a bad thing. Just go with it. Relax. I'm just going to show you, just because I come to the end of this little thing that will help explain that, how to make a garment using nothing but holes. And so I'm going to start by giving you five little examples. All of them are made of little pillowcases or duvet shapes. This one I'm going to do on its side, because I like to sometimes stick a side, pattern sideways to just try and get away from that upright way of thinking. Um, a duvet is just a, a rectangle and a rectangle put on top of each other, and then you stitch along, up and down. So let's imagine that the underneath one is stripy, 
and it's open on this end. So that's where you'd put the pillow in or the duvet in, or if it was a person, your feet might come out of there. So if I stitch up here, along and down, a person could get into it, but they wouldn't be able to get out of it. Now what I'm going to do is, the way that we think of garments is always in this treating lefts and rights as if they're somehow separate from each other, not the same. This is how we see them hanging in shops with our front facing the customer as they walk in and our back behind it. And we think of garments in this upright way with a bottom and a top, but you can blow it open and see it from above instead, from an aerial bird's eye viewpoint. If I take that idea onto a pattern like this and I put my front here and my back behind it, opened out. In order for that pattern to come together, like this one here, I'd have to pick up my shoulders, join it, and then lift it, and it would rise that way. And so if I unite my side seams, it will create a loop. If you remember, when I was cutting open the garment, it had a loop on one side and a much longer loop on that side. This is the reason, because I've joined them. And if you cut through just one layer only, you begin to see the other fabric on the other side. But this is actually a twin perspective pattern. It's going in both this direction and this direction, because you're getting into it this way, but you're coming out of it that way. I want you to kind of understand this, because it's quite a sort of an unusual thing to see. So I'll just cut one open for you. I'm going to show you just the top layer, though, not the stripy layer. And I'll, um, so it, with the stripy layer, it's slightly more complex, because you remember that it's joined on this edge, that edge, and that edge. So the plane goes into stripe, plane into stripe, plane into stripe. I'll just show you what the top layer only looks like. This bit I'm removing, I'm going to come back to, to explain to you what exactly subtraction cutting is and how it's different from the perspective of viewing patterns. I've got now my front at the top and my back down the bottom, and I've cut a singular looped hole in it. And if I view this now from an aerial perspective, from a bird's eye view, and I take my front shoulders and my back shoulders, this garment then rises upwards like this. Very simple. Sew your shoulders, the side seams loop so you continue all the way round till eventually you just run out. And the same on the other side. But we're not making things in cardboard or paper or wood or stone or anything hard. Of course, in fabric, it's going to collapse. And you're going to end up with something that has lots of volume that you step in under here, up through, into a very fitted bodice block. So it's fitted up top, but very voluminous down bottom. But it's made from just one thing, and that's a hole. A hole that's cut with a looping side seam. You can use this technique to make any garment type. You could have a skirt, front of a skirt, back of a skirt behind it, put some little darts in the back so it's a bit fitted to go over your bum, then go through one side seam and through one side seam, looping them together, cut through one layer only, and now it's coming out this way. If we could do a trouser leg, we could do a front with a pocket and a back with a dart, and we go through your inside leg and then your outside leg, cutting through one layer only. And for a trouser leg, we'd need one pair or two of them, one for the left, one for the right. For a sleeve, you could have a sleeve head, which then goes from your underseam to your underseam, cutting through one layer only. Now we can start, once we've got this going, because you've got to imagine that when this comes out and joins, we've also got the stripy side collapsing behind it, so that's going to be even more unusual as to what on earth that's going to make. If safe with a sleeve version, rather than cutting a hole big enough for the body to get through, I cut a hole big enough for an arm to get through. I could cut a hole here that joins across a diagonal valley fold to a pair on the other side. A to A, they join together. Now I could cut a hole here, B, into the stripy side over here that joins. What on earth is it going to make when it's sewn together? Your arms can be passing through it, it's a square, it's, it's, like, it's complex, you can't know. So you've got to try it out. You'll only never know if you actually get material and try it. It forces you to be practical. It forces you to be a pattern cutter, a designing pattern cutter, rather than a cutter Rather than a designer that can't make, you're suddenly a designer that is empowered to make, because it's through making that you learn these things and discover entirely new stuff that's never before been made. I want to just take this as the closest step to it being like that pattern here, and that is taking this method and the whole methods and joining them together. 
And for that, I started off with a long tube that's three metres or more long. You can do it shorter, but it's a good starting point, three metres. And it's at least 150 centimetres. And it's made from two materials, one yellow, one grey, that are opened out. And that's where your legs would come in. Now this time, instead of doing my backs and fronts in line with each other, you can, if you want to, lock them in tighter so that you waste less material, or you can drift them apart and waste more. Why would you want to waste more? Sometimes you need a more unusual bit that you're removing to use for a secondary purpose to make another garment from. So sometimes wasting is actually the beginning of solving a new problem. So sometimes it's important to waste. I would never say don't waste. It's very important to sometimes be wasteful in order to find another solution for that waste. Of course, if you put things into massive production, of course you don't want to waste. But when we're working at prototype level, it's very important that we don't feel we cannot waste or we cannot make mistakes. I'm going to put my fronts over here on a bias grain line going this way, front, and then I'm going to put my, my back nowhere near it. Maybe I'm going to put it over here, facing this way. And now I'm going to join my side seams, not with just a simple loop, but with a freehand drawn loop, like that. What on earth is that going to make? And then once we've got that and it's sewn together, what happens when I join circles together that go over into the other side of this because you've got to remember that this is just double sided material that is got stripy fabric coming through it. When you unfold this pattern that I'm drawing now it kind of gets closer to this. You can kind of see how I've put my backs and fronts not totally towards each other. It's good to always have the necks facing a bit towards each other, never totally away from each other. Whenever I position them I would have positioned this pattern when I was drawing this on the cloth. Because I, I draw my patterns directly onto cloth. I don't draw them onto paper. Um, I think it's much better to work in the material because then you've got a better feeling for the softer kind of geometry that this uses. I would have positioned my patterns like this, drawn around the top part of it, and then I would have looped my side seams together. One with a long loop and one with a short loop. And I just do it straight onto the cloth then and there, using the curves of your wrist and your elbows. If you want to go up and down in the way that you draw this, knock yourself out, but you have to sew that line. So give yourself a challenge or make it nice and pure and simple. And then we have hole A, matching to hole A, and then hole B, matching to hole B. And between them, there's a valley fold line that you wouldn't really see or know about if you hadn't had it explained to you, such as this. Kind of, that's the end, apart from the patterns that I hang in my studio, or if, which might go into production, don't really look much like garment patterns because they're the other way of seeing things. Here I have my hole from which I subtracted this bit here, and I call this the subtraction pattern. The subtraction is there's the front and there's the back, but this is the bit in between, the space, so this bit here. And so I'd make a cardboard pattern of that bit, not of the positive bits. It confuses somebody though, because um, like if you take it to a factory and you give them this pattern, this is a, my back and my front are on 45 degree angles to each other. This is a bias cut dress. But actually the dress is the bit that's missing. It's everything that isn't here. This is the subtraction only. But it's much more practical to have it in a smaller piece like this, rather than a paper pattern or cardboard pattern that is, say, twice the length of the room. That would be impractical. So when it's like this, it's kind of like, it's the negative way of looking at patterns from a different perspective. But for some people, when they first see it, they'll be like, well, how the hell do you put that on? You don't put this on, you put on everything else. And often in, you know, when I take it to factories and things, if I want to put it into production, initially, I, and I always found this, that people say, you can't do that, it's not possible. What is it? And then what you have to do is you have to get on a sewing machine and show them, you have to make it for them. And in the process of doing so, you respect their craft. You, they know that you can sew, you are showing them the way, and then immediately you have a kind of a, a bond. You work together and you kind of understand each other more. And they respect that you're a designer that can make stuff. And I think that's always important. If ever in your future you have to go to a factory, don't just treat them as if they're kind of some sort of maker that must realise everything you do and uh, whilst you crack the whip. It's much better to sort of get involved with what they do, show them, have some knowledge of it, and you learn a lot of that by just watching people. I, lost, I learned a great deal just by watching people at work and trying to just pick up and mimic 
their little techniques that they use because that's how really subtraction kind of came about this strange way of looking at the world and that's it don't know